Thank you very much for the organizers, George, Luke, thank you for having me here. Uh, it's a real pleasure uh, to come back to Howard. Uh, I've been here a number of times. It's always great to see uh, familiar faces and friends. So um, what I'm going to do is sort of uh, um, talk to you a little bit about some of the work on uh, gene therapy for heart failure. And I'm going to try to uh, go from where Judy had left off a little bit and tell you some of the milestones that someone goes through as uh, they uh, uh, go from uh, very basic work all the way to clinical trials uh, in that. So um, heart failure is sort of the focus uh, of uh, my research for many years. And as you can see here in the US, it's a continued uh, unmet need. Um, this is a projection over the next 20 years for the incidence of heart failure, which is continuing to increase despite what we just heard about coronary disease, which is decreasing. And one of the reasons that this is uh, uh, increasing is because we do such a good job at uh, uh, saving the lives of patients with coronary syndromes. Uh, unfortunately, some of them uh, end up with ventricular dysfunction leading to heart failure. So the prognosis is, uh, continues to be uh, bad in, in congestive heart failure. And uh, in class three, four, uh, heart failure, the prognosis is as bad as in patients uh, with advanced cancer. Um, so we continue to have high five-year mortality it's a leading cause of hospitalization. In fact, the uh, hospitalization is one of the reasons why, uh, one of the endpoints that the FDA is, um, is most concerned about. So many therapies uh, focus on that. It's highly pre prevalent in the US uh, and also in the world. So clearly it's a, it's a big uh, problem. Now for many years, the pathophysiology of heart failure is really centered on the fact that there's a cardiac injury that induces the activation of uh, renin angiotensin system uh, because of the reduced systemic perfusion. This leads to ischemia, growth, and remodeling, and direct toxicity on the cardiac cells, uh, leading to further cell death and more uh, cardiac injury. So this is a pattern uh, that we've known about for many, many years. And the therapies over the years have really focused on that because neurohormonal stimulation in heart failure has been uh, very important, uh, whether it's norepinephrine, ANP, endothelin, uh, vasopressin. All these uh, have been quite elevated in heart failure, have been shown to be elevated. And for that reason, it's been very important in the evolution of our uh, therapies. So, um, you know, 50 years ago, uh, the focus had been on trying to diurese patients with congestive heart failure to improve their symptoms. Um, in the 80s, inotropes had a lot of uh, promise, but unfortunately, that didn't come through. Um, and the survival benefits really came when the neurohormonal agents uh, were used, so ACE inhibitors, uh, showed improved survival, uh, then beta blockers, which were obviously uh, not what you would think that they, they would be doing, but clearly they had a very uh, powerful effect on uh, survival in patients with heart failure. And more recently, uh, the dual inhibition of angiotensin II receptors and neprolysin have added uh, to the armamentarium. Again, it's always been about neurohormonal activation and how you manipulate um, or block the neurohormones to improve heart failure. Now, device therapies, including biventricular pacemakers and ICDs, have been very uh, uh, effective in specific patient populations. So, for BIV pacing, uh, for patients um, who have uh, uh, evidence of delays. Uh, in their conduction systems and, IC, and uh, ICDs for patients who have ventricular arrhythmias or are prone to ventricular arrhythmias uh, uh, post-MI or even in uh, straight dilated cardiomyopathy. So these are really saved uh, lives in, in uh, patients with heart failure. 
Ventricular assist devices have also been used and they're really becoming more and more sophisticated and smaller and smaller. This is a heartbeat too, basically showing that you can really get a very uh, good flow in patients with severe heart failure uh, in, um, uh, by implanting these devices and they're becoming more and more uh, miniaturized so that you can really have patients on them for longer and longer periods of time. Now obviously, uh, cardiac transplantation is the end point where many patients who have very severe heart failure uh, can get to. So there are about 2,000 transplants uh, that are uh, performed in the U.S. That number has been stable for about 15 years now. Hasn't increased, hasn't decreased, but really this is kind of the plateau for number of cardiac transplants in the U.S. So, um, as I mentioned, the injury pattern to heart failure uh, can be any type of uh, uh, toxicity to the cardiac cell, whether it's ischemia through coronary disease and myocardial infarction, familial predisposition, hypertension, pregnancy, uh, valvular heart disease, alcohol. There's certain uh, uh, predisposing factor or a direct toxic effect that causes the heart cell to uh, become dysfunctional and then leads to further heart failure. And basically you're left with a myocardium that has diseased cardiac cells, fibroblasts proliferating with extracellular matrix and fibrosis setting in and abnormalities in blood vessels. Now, cell therapy has really been focused on either replacing exogenously the cardiac uh, cells that have died and the fibrosis that have replaced it with stem cells or with um, endogenously trying to recruit uh, cells that are already there, uh, such as seek it, uh, positive cells or other types of cardiac progenitor cells to the area of fibrosis to repopulate that area. Uh, whereas gene therapy has, has really focused on trying to understand what happens to the cardiac cell. And in gene therapy, uh, it's always important to sort of think about uh, trying to understand what happens at the level of excitation and contraction coupling. So for me, uh, when I was uh, focusing on uh, cardiac biology work, uh, as Judy mentioned, it's very important to have different mentors at different stages in one's academic career. So, and again, the mentor-mentee relationship um, is always aimed at promoting the development of both. So that's, that's been a very, it's, it's a very important uh, component of, uh, of this. However, uh, you know, as you, you know, the younger you are in your training, uh, that relationship obviously is very skewed, and as you go further, uh, things uh, will change. So for example, uh, I did a lot of research in muscle mechanics uh, when I was at Johns Hopkins, uh, not too far from here with Kichi Sagawa. And we worked on a lot of modeling and uh, my filament work. Uh, and as I was leaving Hopkins to go to Boston, he said to me, you know, you need to just, you know, uh, take this work in, in engineering and now really get into molecular biology and try to apply some of the systems that you've uh, learned uh, as an engineer into more biological work. And this is where I worked, started working with Judy Guathmi and uh, Judy had uh, a very active lab on looking at calcium handling and failing myocardium. And again, this was again a second type of uh, uh, focus for me, very different from what I had before, uh, and allowed me to really expand into areas of interest. So this work that Judy had started on uh, calcium cycling abnormality, I mean, I don't think she made a, a very emphatic uh, presentation about her role, but really uh, a lot of the work that followed, uh, that followed were really uh, based on uh, uh, hypertrophic response genes being elevated, um, abnormal uh, energetics, protease and caspase induction in, in uh, calcium cycling. And that really has uh, focused the work on how the SR calcium ATPase pump, which uh, allows calcium to be brought back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, is downregulated in advanced heart failure. 
uh, and this whole initial insult to the heart all the way to a biomechanically stressed heart, uh, which has a hypertrophic response, returning back to a fetal gene program uh, and leading to further advanced uh, dysfunction of uh, the heart has been, a lot of it has uh, come from the initial observations and the physiological work that Judy uh, had done. So um, when I started to work on, on gene therapy, the idea was that uh, we would take um, genes of interest in, in heart failure that are dysregulated and targeting them. And we had to choose vectors, we had to choose modes of delivery, immune response, and finally getting to clinical trials. And the promise of uh, gene therapy have seen a lot of ups and downs. So many years ago in the 1980s, uh, it was very kind of a interesting concept. You have a gene that's missing or too much of the gene and you just knock it down or overexpress it uh, with these vectors. Uh, then the failures started coming in. Uh, the uh, cystic fibrosis trials didn't work. Uh, then Jesse Gelsinger, who had this OTC deficiency, non-fatal uh, non disease, died after a gene therapy complication. Uh, then uh, gene therapy was cured in a number of uh, kids with uh, immunodeficiency in Paris, but some of these uh, kids went on to have leukemia. Uh, like disorders, uh, then uh, we start seeing some improvements in uh, uh, the vector technology and uh, uh, we've seen now a number of trials uh, improving vision in patients with Leber amaurosis. Uh, I'll show you some of the results we had. And then now factor 9 and factor 10 have been uh, have been uh, replaced by gene therapy, and this is really becoming a cure in patients with hemophilia. And uh, a few years ago, the European Union has approved the first gene therapy product. So gene therapy is really has had a lot of ups and downs, uh, but we've definitely seen a reemergence of all the gene therapy work. Now, these are some of the vectors that uh, I always like to show that uh, are used in gene therapy. Um, and they go from the very large uh, herpes virus that you see on the top left. Next to it is the adenovirus, which is a workhorse of gene therapy. And uh, one of our favorite vi viruses for uh, cardiovascular and heart failure disease is this one here. It's a parvovirus, quite small. So a lot of the validation of Judy talked about, you know, uh, getting people together and, and working uh, and some, some things happen by chance and some things are uh, fateful. <laughs> so it's not clear whether uh, working with Federica was fateful or, or by chance, but clearly it redefined uh, how uh, we did our work because a lot of the validation for the circuit gene therapy that ensued uh, came from Federica's uh, capable uh, hands and, and mind. And this is just showing some of the cardiac cells that she used to isolate in patients with uh, heart failure at the time of transplant. This is showing that delivering circa can rescue the failure phenotype. This shows the survival benefit in, uh, in rats uh, uh, with heart failure that preceded all the work in clinical trials. So that work uh, that Federica did really showed that gene therapy can restore circa 2A and have a functional benefit in, uh, uh, in a large number uh, of uh, animal models. And uh, I, I mentioned that the parvovirus was one of our favorite vectors because uh, this is where the adeno-associated vector is derived. It's non-pathogenic. It's quite small, so you can see the size here compared to a, an adenovirus. It results in long-term expression and has broad distribution to the myocardium. And that's when we, uh, many, 10 years ago, we constructed uh, this vector, which has a promoter, a human circuit 2A, uh, to drive it. And we conducted the first clinical trial in patients with severe heart failure. This was a Cupid one. Sorry, the movie is not playing. Uh, but basically showing that we can actually deliver these vectors 
to a very sick patient population. So these were class three, class four patients um, and ejection fraction of about 20%. Um, and this is done in the cath lab, uh, either a femoral approach or an anticubital approach. Um, and the patient goes home the same day. Uh, it's delivered via commercially guided available angiographic systems down the coronary arteries. And initial uh, phase two trials showed improvement in uh, functional parameters, such as the O2 max biomarkers and uh, heart failure hospitalization uh, with, uh, uh, showed an improvement with AV circa. Now we, we started a bigger trial, uh, an international trial, uh, where we looked at AV1 versus placebo in uh, 60 centers, 30 in the US, 30 in Europe, uh, and uh, it was a real hassle to try to get all these vectors into the right place. Uh, but unfortunately, this trial did not show benefit. This is the cumulative number of events per patient, and even though AV1 circa seemed to break away early on, uh, in the end, the uh, curves were uh, inseparable, and then probability of having a terminal event, whether it's uh, death or LVAD placement or transplant, were the same between circa and placebo. So clearly this was a, um, a trial that was uh, uh, neutral, that didn't uh, show any effect. And uh, part of the uh, issues with biologics is you know how they're made and how delivery is done. And this is showing from patients who had biopsies uh, taken from uh, at the time of VAT placement or transplant, uh, how the uptake was. And we can see that uh, the uptake is quite low. So um, this corresponds to the number of infected cardiac cells. And in animal models, we always had very high copies of viral DNA going in, whereas in the humans, it was quite small. Uh, so, based on uh, these data, we're uh, uh, going to start a trial uh, in the next six months or so with a much higher dose of AV circo. Uh, again, a lot of the work on gene therapy is always tempered by you want to be safe, you don't want to have any issues, so we always try to decrease the dose, and that was an issue when we did the first trials. Uh, now we're going to try to get much higher dose to see if we can increase the uptake of the vector. We also have uh, um, trials uh, planned for AV1 circa for inhaled AV1 circa in patients with pulmonary uh, hypertension. We're quite excited about this because it really has a very dramatic effect on um, uh, patients, uh, or I'm sorry, on the animal models uh, outcome. And this is a, a pulmonary hypertension is really a disease with very few uh, effective therapies that can improve uh, lifestyle and uh, survival. Uh, we've also uh, gone on to make other vectors. Uh, so uh, if we want to improve the uptake, one of the things is to make AV vectors that have better tropism um, and less tropism to liver and lung, but more to the heart. And one of the issues with, uh, neutral, with the AV vectors is that because um, they're in, uh, in nature, you may have neutralizing antibodies against them. And in fact, depending on the region where you are, in any of the serotypes, you may have up to you know, 60 or 70% of the population that has them. Um, so we've started to make novel vectors by DNA shuffling and directed evolution. Uh, basically, you take many of the AV vectors, you break down the DNA and make mosaics uh, that you can test for what you want. So, higher cardiac tropism, uh, uh, escape of neutralizing antibody. And this is one of the vectors that we made uh, called BNP116 uh, um, with Jude Samalski at University of North Carolina. It's a mosaic of different serotypes. And um, we're starting now um, uh, work with this specific vector at, uh, in a phase one trial using 
inhibitor 1, which is a different target than circuit 2A um, upstream that Lisa Cranius uh, has worked on, and we helped her with our with the gene therapy component, and actually Federica is part of uh, that team that worked on it many years ago. So uh, this is, uh, we just got FDA approval for this, and we're continuing on uh, this new gene therapy program. Uh, we've also had uh, the gene therapy work in, in, in humans has led us to examine more what happens to circuit 2A as a protein, uh, and we've identified uh, Sumulation, which is small ubiquitin modifier, as a way to change the circa uh, function. And based on that work, uh, we have now a big uh, small molecule program uh, where we are targeting circa 2A sumulation directly. And uh, we have now a candidate that's going to preclinical testing after you know four or five years of work on this. Uh, and this has been quite exciting to Know, go from a gene therapy program to a small molecule based on uh, some of the uh, results from the gene therapy work. So um, we have worked on Circa for many years. This is work, uh, as, as Judy mentioned, on calcium cycling uh, that started many, many years ago. Uh, and whether it's activating of Circa, which is another program, or gene therapy of Circa, other components uh, of the gene therapy program has also been uh, put in place. So we're quite excited that we have this uh, multi uh, uh, kind of directional and multi uh, initiatives for targeting circuit way, which we feel is very important in patients with heart failure. We've had obviously uh, uh, you know, failures in, in, in the gene therapy trial but I think we're persisting. So this is part of our translation uh, from discovery all the way to clinical trials. And we've been constantly renewing ourselves in terms of gene therapy, vector development, imaging to help us guide uh, our work. Uh, and again, uh, as Judy mentioned, uh, you know, the key for surviving as a clinician scientist in cardiovascular medicine is really persistence. So we've been you know, knocked down many times, whether by reviewers, by reality of clinical trials. Uh, so you really need the energy and uh, to to continue your work, uh, and you know, constant renewal. I think this is a really important thing in my career. This has been very very critical because we you are constantly faced with barriers. So if you have a set of uh, uh, things or tools that you know about and that you can you have mastered in the past and you constantly want to use them, that's just not going to work. Uh, so we renewed ourselves, I mean, I had to renew myself constantly, uh, you know, first with the gene therapy work, uh, trying to uh, develop novel vectors, trying to incorporate all the new uh, vector technology in the lab, uh, working with large animals, which we never done before, using imaging modalities to track uh, the vectors uh, and to better understand the improvement in function and then uh, most importantly clinical trials which is really just another set of complexity in dealing with the FDA and much you know more recently uh, I had to you know learn the whole lexicon for small molecules and how to uh, navigate that field which is very different than uh, gene therapy, so constantly adapting to the new environment through collaborations, through self-learning is, is important. So um, thank you very much, George, uh, and uh, Luke, for giving me this opportunity. I hope uh, uh, you know, ACIC will, will, will flourish in the future based on these really uh, important parameters for how to uh, go about doing uh, cardiovascular research.